This film is lit, the podcast where we finally settle the score on one simple question. Is the book really better than the movie? I'm Brian, and I have a film degree, so I watch the movie, but don't read the book. And I'm Katie. I have an English degree, so I do things the right way and read the book before we watch the movie. So prepare to be wowed by our expertise and charm as we dissect all of your favorite film adaptations and decide if the silver screen or the written word did it better. So turn it up, settle in, and get ready for spoilers, because this film is lit. know something robin i was just wondering are we good guys or bad guys it's robin hood and this film is lit hello and welcome back to this film is Lit, the podcast where we're talking about movies that are based on books welcome to our march madness championship episode the winner of our march madness bracket hope you all enjoyed voting uh, it was a, it was an interesting one. Went down yeah. to the wire. We weren't sure what was going to win. Pull it out, but Disney's Robin Hood came out on top. If you weren't aware, uh, if you only listen to the show and aren't engaging on social media, uh, every March we do. Well, the last two now, I think we do a March Madness bracket. Uh, while you know the the real March Madness is going on, we do our own. Uh, and this year it was Robin Hood. We had what 16, 12? 12. 12 different Robin Hood films to choose from and they were matched up against each other voted on by the fans widowed down to uh, our 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 champion and our runner-up our champion like i said disney's robin hood our runner-up was robin hood men in tights so if you want to hear us talk about robin hood men in tights you're gonna have to head over to patreon.com slash this film is lit give us five bucks a month or more for bonus content and that'll be out here uh before too long hopefully at the end of march maybe very beginning of april Got a lot going on right now, but that is what we will be talking about for the bonus episode for March. Uh, Yeah, our runner-up. We weren't sure if it was going to be our winner, but it was not. We're talking about Disney. We have uh, no Guess Who, right? No. Okay. And no Lost in Adaptation, but we have all the rest of our segments, so we're going to get right into it with our first segment in case you have not read uh, The Merry Adventures of Robin Hood or seen the disney film in a while we're gonna give you a brief synopsis and let me sum up let me explain no there is too much let me sum up howard piles the the merry adventures of robin hood is a collection of tales following the life of legendary outlaw robin hood and his band of merry men including little john will scarlet alan adale and friar tuck among others The stories in Pyle's collection cover how Robin came to be an outlaw living in Sherwood Forest, how several of the Merry Men came to join him, uh, their adventures and various clashes with the Sheriff of Nottingham, Robin's fight with Guy of Gisborne, uh, how King Richard pardoned Robin, and eventually Robin's death. In the movie Disney's Robin Hood, Our story is narrated by the rooster, Alan Adale, who tells us the story of Robin Hood and Maid Marian. Robin Hood and Little John live in Sherwood Forest, where they rob from the rich and give to the poor, who are being overtaxed by Prince John and his muscle, the Sheriff of Nottingham. The Sheriff has made it his duty to capture Robin and Little John, but he cannot seem to manage it. Prince John sits on his brother's, King Richard's, throne, while Richard is away on a crusade, uh, which we find out uh the prince john's little uh what is his is a um advisor mm. sir hiss or something yeah. like that who is a snake had uh entranced king richard to get him to go on that crusade apparently he sits on his brother's throne while uh, richard is away on a, on a crusade uh, prince john is greedy and immature and he's a terrible leader uh, Robin and Little John rob Prince R- Prince Richard's caravan while pretending to be fortune tellers, and the prince puts a bounty on their heads. Robin continues his spree of helping the needy, giving a bow in his hat to a young rabbit whose family was recently the victim of the prince's exorbitant taxes. We're then introduced to Maid Marian, niece of King Richard, and a childhood friend of Robin, and her lady-in-waiting, Lady Cluck. She has been in London for years, and having just recently returned, assumes Robin no longer remembers her. They were childhood friends. 
The prince decides to host an archery uh, tournament with the prize of a golden arrow and a kiss from Maid Marian in the hope that it will lure Robin out of hiding so he may be captured. Robin disguises himself and attends the contest where he wins before being exposed and sentenced to death. Luckily, Little John is able to get the drop on the prince and threaten him into releasing Robin. A fight breaks out. Robin and Lady Cluck... Marion and Little John all escape into the forest. Robin and Marion enjoy a romantic evening together, dancing, and Robin gives her a ring. Prince John learns of a song the locals have made up to make fun of him and throws pretty much everybody in jail, including Friar Tuck, whom the prince orders to be executed, hoping it will again lure Robin to attempt a rescue. The night before the execution, Robin and Little John sneak into the castle, freeing everyone and stealing John's riches out from under his nose. A battle ensues, and Robin is thought to be killed by an arrow after trying to escape into the moat. Eventually, he emerges unharmed, and Prince John loses his mind at his defeat. King Richard returns, pardons Robin, and Robin marries Marion, and they all live happily ever after. The end. Yeah. Let's get into it. You have a disclaimer first. I have a quick disclaimer. Um, so for this episode, I read Howard Pyle's The Merry Adventures of Robin Hood, which is one single book. Um, now, obviously, one single text does not encompass every single variation on every single Robin Hood story that exists. I will hedge my answers and add additional info where I can, but I don't want to get too lost in the woods trying to do that. Um, so I just want to mention that up front. Um, I also want to take this opportunity to remind everyone that, as we've discussed before, there is no such thing as an original or real version of a folktale. There you go. Uh, my disclaimer is I'm just getting over a cold, so that's why I sound weird. <laughs> <laughs> my voice is a little off, but <laughs> that's what's going on. All right, it's time. I had quite a few questions. We'll get into them in Was That in the Book? Nicholas Flamel is the only known maker of the Philosopher's Stone. The what? Honestly, don't you two read? All right, first up, we get our setting established in the story uh, through Alan Adale, who's kind of giving us the backstory. Um, is Alan Adale a character? Yes. What is, he? What, is he a... He's a minstrel. Is he a bard? Oh, a minstrel. Yeah, okay. minstrel bard. Yeah, that sort of deal. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, but he's setting it up, and we explained that uh, Prince John is filling in for his brother, King Richard, who is away on a crusade. And I was wondering if that is the similar background for our story. Um, Prince John is evil and greedy, whereas it's implied that King Richard is like a King Richard is like a just and you know good leader. And I was wondering if we have the same backdrop for our story in your book. So no. Um, Prince John doesn't appear in the book until the very last chapter. He does end up being a villain, but he's not the primary antagonist of Pyle's text by any stretch of the imagination. Okay. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about Disney's take on Prince John, which is pretty classically queer coded. Uh, one of those queer coded villains. Interesting. It didn't stick out to me as much as near, I mean I can see I can see it now that you mention it. It didn't stick out to me as much as many of their other villains. Mm -hmm. Like I, I don't know, it didn't feel as intense as like, you know. It's Jafar not a, it's not as intense as some of the, <laughs> some other, of ones. the other ones. But he he's <clears throat> he's pretty like effete. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um y you know, and that Obviously, that is an issue, at least on some level. He's also a fun villain, I think. He's a little bit over the top, fun to watch. I think it's kind of interesting to see how clear of a precursor he is to Scar from The Lion King. I mean, definitely in terms of, like, his role. But I, I don't see the character. I think relation. there's a little bit in, like, the mannerisms there. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess I can see what you're saying. It's been a while since I've seen The Lion King, to be fair. So. Yeah. Um, so I, I think he's a fun villain. Um, or maybe I just have the Disney twist villain fatigue, and I'm, I'm yearning for the flamboyant <laughs> villains of yore. Yeah. Um, but I, I do think he's a, a fun villain. Yeah, I, I thought he was fun. I, I, I enjoyed him for the most part. Uh, so we that we get open up with a, kind of the main song and its recurring motif that is throughout the movie. And I wanted to know if this is from something. It's a phrase or, you know, maybe it came from the book or what. Uh, and that is Ode to Lally, which is like a song, but then also a thing that Robin, among others, just kind of say. I think mm -hmm. mainly Robin, but say like throughout the story as like an exclamation yeah. of joy or whatever. Um, so it, it's not anything from the book that I read. Okay, I Googled it. Didn't get anything super definitive, like connecting it back to Robin Hood, aside from this movie. The Disney fandom wiki says that Udalali is 
quote, a term popularized during the 1950s, meaning yay or yippee. Hmm. I, I mean, that's how it's used I, I, in yeah, the Yeah, so that is. I didn't find that anywhere other than the Disney fandom yeah. wiki, so we maybe take that with a grain of salt. Uh, I also found an interesting Reddit thread discussing the possibility that it's a nod to like traditional a traditional Gaelic folk style of singing um, called, and I, I apologize, <laughs> I'm probably about to butcher this, uh, Shanos, mm. um, which is kind of like a lilting style that uses nonsense words to move the music along. Oh, okay, interesting. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that could make sense too. I've yeah. never, yeah. I, I was just, yeah, it seemed like it might be a thing, but it's definitely used the way like as a, you know, yay or like an, like I said, mm-hmm. like an exclamation. So interesting. Yeah, I'd never heard the phrase in, uh, as I mentioned in the prequel episode, I have not seen this movie. I have seen this movie, but I was probably not since you a were really little, child, yeah. a baby, or whatever, and remembered literally nothing about it. Um, and so I did not remember that song. I was like, oh, that's different. We'll get to my thoughts on the music later in the odds and ends. But uh, so uh, the main thing that happened, you know, every the thing everybody knows about Robin Hood. You ask somebody Robin Hood, what do you know about Robin Hood? That will say the same thing every single person. Maybe uh, two things: good archer. Mm-hmm. Robs from the rich, gives to the poor. Mm-hmm. Those are the two things. Maybe like a green outfit. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Like as a third thing. But those first two things are pretty much it. Uh, and I wanted to know if the, which is what they do in this movie. They rob from the rich to give to the poor. And I wanted to know if um, that was an element of this story. Because I thought I remembered in the prequel you mentioning that it was like a later development. I know this is a somewhat later story, obviously. This is from like the 1800s. Yeah. Yeah. So this is later than the original sort of tales of Robin Hood. But I wanted to know if the stealing from the rich and giving to the poor was a primary element of Robin Hood in your book. So uh, Robin being a supporter of the poor has always been a feature in the legend as far as we know. Uh, But in the earliest tales, it doesn't really look like what we might expect because they're based in the ideals of medieval chivalry. Mm. rather than modern ideas about equity or equality. Mm -hmm. So basically, in the older ballads, Robin is like the platonic ideal of what chivalry should look like. He's generous, he's noble, he protects the innocent, he scorns those who don't behave in a manner fitting their station, etc., etc. Okay. Now, the idea specifically that Robin Hood steals from the rich to give to the poor comes by way of Joseph Ritson's 1795 compilation of the existing ballads and stories. And Ritson's version was incredibly influential, and we can definitely see that mark in Howard Pyle's 1820 versions, which is what I read, Mm -hmm. um, in which Robin and his men only rob those who have more than they need. And we don't see them literally redistributing wealth like they do in the movie, but their support of the poor is mentioned quite a few times throughout the text. Hmm. Another interesting thing that I want to mention is that we can also see vestiges of that earlier like platonic ideal of chivalry in Pyle's text, Mm -hmm. especially whenever they rob a wealthy member of the clergy. Mm. Um, Robin and his men get particularly bent out of shape about that because clergymen are supposed to be humble and cast aside earthly treasure, i.e. their behavior is unbefitting of their station. It's ignoble. Yeah. They don't like that. Yeah. It's interesting because it reminds me of something that I mentioned when we did Three Musketeers Mm -hmm. in the Disney movie of Three Musketeers. At the beginning, they steal the Cardinal's, I think it's the Cardinal's um, coach or whatever. Yeah. And it's full of money and expensive wine and stuff. And they start throwing it out. And I and I made a mention in that about them, you know, asking if they did that sort of Robin Hood thing in Mm -hmm. Three Musketeers. But that I remember, I think they make a remark about something along the lines of the Cardinal be, you know, ridiculous. He has like fine. They're like castigating him for like having this finery or whatever. And that kind of sounds like what you're talking about here of like that, that same idea of somebody who's, Espousing certain ideals, but is not living by them. Exactly. Yeah. So moving on, uh, if John is the evil prince, which he said he is at the end, at least, um, I wanted to know if he wears his brother's crown while he's gone, mainly for two reasons. Because in the, so in the movie, uh, Prince John wears Richard's crown while he's off on his crusade. One, I don't think the prince would wear the king's crown while he was gone. I think the, one, I think the king would either take it or mm-hmm. if he didn't take it, I don't think 
that whoever was sitting on the throne in his st- the steward or whatever would wear it, but I don't know. Yeah. And two, uh, assuming if it does happen, uh, is the crown like too large for his head? Because that's like a thing that I remember. There's like some saying about like, or some old like proverb about like a king whose crown is too large for his head is like it, it meant to impl- implicate like that you know he's not befitting of the throne uh-huh. or something like that so okay so we did talk about prince john earlier um in pyle's book he comes to the throne following king richard's death okay so we don't have this element of like he's sitting on the throne so like and like whatever, not yeah. really supposed to be or yeah. like overstepping his bounds um now both prince john and king richard the lionheart were real people like they're real historical yes, figures. Yes, yes. Um, although neither of them started appearing in Robin Hood legends until around the 16th century, uh, about a hundred years following the earliest recorded mentions of Robin Hood. Now, Pyle doesn't make any specific mention of his crown, um, but John wasn't a popular king, and history has been quite critical of his rule, uh, hence his depiction as a villain in these legends. I do think you're right that the crown being too large is some kind of allusion to something, but I, I was like Googling and Googling and I couldn't figure out what the only thing I could find was uh, that kept coming up was like heavy is the head that wears the crown, okay. but that's not the same. No, it's not. I could have swore that I, I had some memory bouncing mm-hmm. around in my head of some saying, or like I said, pro- something about a, a king with a crown too large that feels or something. that feels right to me yeah right like I, that feels familiar to me if anybody knows what we're thinking of i don't know let I, us know maybe i'm not thinking of anything but yeah it seems and because it obviously fits in this scenario where it, it yeah it, 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 it implies yeah that he's not fit for the throne because literally yeah. the crown does not fit on his head so yeah i thought that was interesting you know he's 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 too small to fill the 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 lofty um expectations of his of his position or whatever but it's yeah i was like i feel like that's a thing i've seen that mm-hmm. somewhere or i I've well, heard kind of, of yeah. similar to the idea of like not being able to fill somebody's shoes I yeah guess. yeah same idea like oh uh, you know you, yeah and maybe that is what i'm thinking of is mm-hmm. you know just big shoes to fill or mm-hmm. maybe the polar the opposite of that being too big for your britches or whatever like there's a lot of <laughs> sayings about like things not fitting people who are don't have like the moral character or whatever i just thought it was interesting because i was like i feel like i've heard but yeah Interesting. Okay. So, uh, moving on, we then get to uh, Robin and Little John getting into their antics. This film kind of just starts, jumps right in, in the middle of them being Robin Hood and Little John. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah, we don't get any kind of, like, backstory. No, not really any backstory. They're just already doing their thing when we jump into the film. Uh, And so they see the king's uh, carriage or whatever, and they go to, they're going to rob it, but in order to rob it, they have this plan to they dress up as fortune tellers. They put on dresses and wigs and fake breasts and all this. They dress up as women. They, they cross dress to um, f- to to sneak, basically get a company with the king and then steal his stuff. And I wanted to know if that happens in the book, because I'm fairly certain that in Men in Tights, a similar thing happens. Mm-hmm. I am realizing, too, I want to mention this <laughs> because... This is really sad. I think the only two Robin Hood movies I've ever seen are this and Robin Hood Men in Tights. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen like a a more like, I don't know, serious yeah. adaptation of <laughs> Robin Hood. <laughs> but because uh, I was realizing so many of the things that I recognized f- from this, I only knew from Men in Tights. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was wondering if. And I was like, I think at least some of the Merry Men do in that, or maybe I don't. Maybe Robin Hood doesn't, but I think some of the Merry Men do dress up as women to to like fool somebody or whatever. So I wanted to know if that came from the books. It seemed odd that both of these t- of the two Robin Hood things I've seen, they cross dress in two of them. Um. So Howard Pyle does not recount any instances where they disguise themselves uh, either as women or fortune tellers. Mm. Um. If it happens in multiple adaptations, it's not unconceivable that it's happens in some Some other tale that's just not included in this but they do disguise themselves a lot it is a running plot element throughout many of the stories yeah Yeah. 
I actually had this scene in better in the movie because it's something different than what happens in the book. A lot of the disguise scenes in the book are fun, but they feel very similar to each other. Uh, I don't know. Maybe the scene is problematic. Maybe it's not. I think it's a fun scene. Um, I also think that having them cross dress could be considered like kind of a fun nod to medieval and early modern theater, which is where many of the Robin Hood tales got recorded yeah. later on down the line. Yeah, I'm sure. Like, I'm I'm sure it's not completely unproblematic. But as cross dressing scenes go, in that could could be done in 1972. I think this is about as unproblematic as it, it could is. be. I think it's this There's not, not really bad. jokes at expense of it. Yeah, particularly. Uh, there's also not. They also, because they're dressing up as fortune tellers, they never use other words for That's fortune true, tellers that yeah. were common back then. They don't, you know, they they kind of, and they don't like go over the top doing like cultural stereotypes, really. And I, yeah. at least not that I noticed, like Robin's doing a voice, but it's more of like an old lady voice than yeah. like any sort of like ethnicity or anything yeah. like that. So again, as far as it goes, it struck me as like, you know, about as good as you could <laughs> hope for considering the time period and stuff like that, uh, which was, yeah, a little bit surprising. But yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I have to imagine that there's some story somewhere because again, I, I will we'll obviously know when we watch men in tights here and soon, I I have a memory of some of the merry men dressing as women in that. I mm-hmm. bet that version is very problematic if I had to guess. <laughs> that whole movie is a mess. Uh, but yeah. All right. Then moving on. Talking about uh, the Sheriff of Nottingham in this. The characterization of the Sheriff of Nottingham in this movie was not what I was expecting. And it's not what I like tend to expect from a depiction of the sheriff of Nottingham. He's he came across at least initially as like a bumbling idiot. Mm-hmm. Whereas that's never really the to be fair, the only other movie I've seen, he also comes across as a bumbling idiot, but that is because <laughs> it's a Mel Brooks movie. I felt I thought at least. I assumed that was why he came across he's he was the character he was, is because he's yeah, he's a well, he's also like sniveling and whiny in that movie where like he's yeah. like sniveling like eh, just annoying like evil guy. Uh, who's also kind of an idiot, whereas in this one, he just kind of felt like a a weird, yeah, bumbling, I don't know, he just wasn't remotely what I imagine when I think Sheriff of Nottingham. I think Sheriff of Nottingham, what what jumped to my mind, if you would ask me, like, in Robin Hood, what is that character like? I was thinking more like, taking it back to the Three Musketeers, the, whatever that character's name, who's uh, like the eye-patched, oh, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, captain yeah. of the guard or whatever, you yeah. know, that guy who's like the Cardinal's secondhand guy that's like in the movie at least in the disney movie that's what i kind of envision like a much more intimidating like Mm -hmm. physically imposing scary guy Mm -hmm. uh who's also maybe a little dumber i don't know so i wasn't (laughs) expecting this and i wanted to know well uh, i will addend that by saying maybe he's not as much of an idiot as he comes across in this movie because like in the first scene that we see him he's like walking down the street and he seems really dumb and weird, but then he goes into this house and he's trying to collect taxes and he like immediately figures out that they're hiding money in their cast. Yeah. And like empties it out. So I'm like, well, maybe he's not an idiot. I don't know. Anyways, this is not the sheriff of Nottingham. I was expecting. (laughs) Is this like what it is in the book is my long winded way of getting to the question. I wouldn't say that Pyle's text portrays him as an idiot. He does kind of bungle things, but more so because he's arrogant and he's also kind of a coward. That is the what I expected. Yeah. And the Sheriff of Nottingham, I think, is an interesting character in that his portrayal does change a lot depending on what kind of story is being told. Yeah. Whereas other characters like Robin Hood is fairly consistent across retellings. You know, he's yeah. kind of like chivalrous swashbuckling, like unless you're going for something totally farcical. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the sheriff of Nottingham in particular can ki- it can kind of change up depending on what kind of story is being told. Another version that I think would fit what I was kind of expecting. It's not a version of but uh, another character that kind of fits what I was expecting, especially based on what you said, where uh, you said he's kind of he, he, he messes up. He bungles things because he's arrogant and kind of a coward. Prince Humperdinck would be another yeah. example of yeah. the type of character that I was kind of imagining. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Sheriff of right. Nottingham. Less of an be. idiot, but still like someone who gets in his own way. Yes, because of other character yeah. flaws, but not just like this 
southern bumpkin who like again obviously he's not southern it's, but you know what i mean like it's just it's such a different characterization than i was expecting getting to uh maid marion we're introduced to maid marion uh in this one who is also a fox I, I i wasn't even going to try to suss out how animals were what they were ver- and how they were related <laughs> to other i was like doesn't matter doesn't matter who cares she's the she's the niece of the king who's a uh, lion i would assume but <laughs> whatever yeah that's very strange but um we're introduced to her she is uh, uh like like i said the niece of the king and she has a lady in waiting which is a classic thing uh, again from my only other experience in with robin hood in men in tights she also has a lady in waiting her you know handmaiden whatever you want to call it mm. who kind of keep takes care of her and stuff and they're very similar depictions <laughs> they're very uh, buxom lasses, mm. shall we say, in both this and Men in Tights. And I wanted to know if that was like the typical betrayal or portrayal of Maid Marian's uh, Lady in Waiting. <laughs> so uh, sadly, Maid Marian does not appear in Pyle's text. Mm, okay. uh, the first story mentions that Robin has a sweetheart back home. And then in a much later story, he specifically like thinks about his love made Marion. Mm-hmm. She's named, but she's never actually in it. We don't meet her. We don't interact with her. Okay. So made Marion didn't start appearing in the Robin Hood legends until the early 1600s, right around the same time as Friar Tuck showed up. She also wasn't always nobility, but was often portrayed as a shepherdess in the earlier stories, which is in line with her and Robin's association with May Day celebrations at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, And she began being portrayed as nobility around the late 1600s, which is around the same time that it became common to portray Robin himself as exiled nobility. Oh, interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, that was not always the case. I I didn't even know that was ever. the. I didn't know that was Mm -hmm. part of some of sometimes part of robin's backstory that's a a lot of and that's especially more common in like modern interpretations to have him be like an exiled lord or something definitely gives you some juicy like you know yeah (laughs) chosen one kind of not not necessarily chosen ones but yeah dark sorted backstory Mm -hmm. that you get to uh, unearth Uh, i couldn't find anything about a recurring lady in waiting character in the older tales but I think that does make sense if Marion is going to be nobility, that she would have like a lady in waiting. Interesting. Well, then now it makes me wonder. Okay, so one of our movies that was in the poll that could have won and was in the final four was Prince of Thieves, which I believe mm-hmm. Men in Tights is primarily a satire of Prince of Thieves and the original Errol Flynn, not yeah. original, but the Errol Flynn Robin Hood, which was also in the final four, I think. Yes. Yeah. And so I'm assuming that probably in those that the character of the lady in waiting, which I can't remember her name in men in tights, I believe she's like German in men in tights mm-hmm. um, or something like that or Bavarian or whatever. But I, uh, I do wonder if that character in men in tights is based on that because it is interesting to me that she's very similar. It's not very similar, but she was, she reminded me, the, of Lady Cluck in this reminded me of her lady in waiting in. Yeah. Well, and I think tights. too, we're going back to some more broad tropes. That's about true. having yes. like, so you have like the ingenue mm-hmm. who's like stereotypically waifish. beautiful. She's waifish. Yes. She's maybe like a damsel in distress. Right. And then in contrast to her, you have, her maid, her lady in waiting, what have you, who is a sturdier who's sort s- of sturdier stock. <laughs> yes. Or maybe sometimes she's older. Yeah. Like I'm thinking of like Romeo and Juliet, mm. where uh, Juliet's nurse is like an older woman. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and we're we're kind of setting up this idea of like like the ideal. Right. And then the person who doesn't get to be with anybody doesn't get to be with anybody yeah yeah Yeah, absolutely (laughs) definitely problematic i was just yeah i was just wondering it's definitely of its time i guess shall we say Mm -hmm. but yeah it was was interesting okay uh so speaking of mad mary and you kind of explained on this a little bit but it looks like you're gonna expand on it here uh i was wondering if robin hood had a history with maid marion because that was not something i expected is that in this movie robin or maid marion explain or mentions that 
her and Robin were childhood friends. Maybe yeah. I, I don't remember if she uh, specifically, she specifically says childhood sweethearts. Okay, I think. yes. Uh, and so they were childhood sweethearts, and then she went off to London to you know study or whatever. Yeah, and he did not, and so they 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 you know they fell out with each other, and she doesn't know if he even remembers her anymore. And I wanted to know if that was a common again. Now you've explained that she's not really in this book, but if that element of them having been like childhood sweethearts and reuniting was part of the typical Robin Hood made Marian story. So for Pyle's text specifically, I would give that a strong maybe. Um, considering that Robin mentions a sweetheart, like right when we first meet him uh, and he's supposed to be pretty young, like late teens. Mm -hmm. um, so assuming that that sweetheart is made Marian, uh, probably. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it would make sense. Yeah. Expanding beyond Pyle, there's a lot to consider. Uh, we don't really know where the character of Maid Marian springs from. Some think she was initially a personification of the Virgin Mary, to whom very early versions of Robin Hood is devoted. Interesting. Uh, others think she's more specifically rooted to the May Day traditions and might come from French folklore about a shepherdess named Marianne with an O and not an A. Uh, in some very early ballads, Robin has a love interest named Clorinda, who's also a shepherdess. So it's thought that at some point these characters merged. Like, uh, but but like many aspects of folklore, it's kind of a chicken and egg type of situation. Uh, but after Marion began appearing in the tales, it became common pretty quickly for her to be Robin's love interest. Whether they or not they have an extended history or were childhood sweethearts depends on the version of the story. But I think it's pretty common in modern retellings for them to have been linked some way in childhood. Okay, yeah. Like I said, my only other experience, Men in Tights, I don't remember if that's the case or not. So, guess we'll find out. Yes, we will find out. Uh, so the big one of the big ones, uh, the recurring thing that is, like I said, because famously Robin Hood is a very good archer. The thing that I every version of it that I've ever seen includes some sort of archery contest or tournament <clears throat> that Robin just cannot stop himself from attending. And I wanted to know uh, that obviously happens in this movie. The, uh, the prince throws a, an archery contest. Uh, and this is the same in Men in Tights, where it's an attempt to draw Robert, Robin out of hiding so that he may be captured because they know he cannot resist uh, an archery tournament. And in this case, there's the added level of he, if he were to win, he gets the uh, a kiss from Maid Marian to whoever wins the tournament. Mm. Um, so there's like an added layer to it, which I think in Men in Tights, it's literally just he he's so like proud of himself for how good of an archer he is that he can't resist going to win the tournament or whatever. Um, but I want to know if an archery contest was, was in your story. This plot point is directly from a story that Pyle recounts uh, called the shooting match at Nottingham town, uh, where the sheriff of Nottingham holds an archery contest as a trap to capture Robin hood. Uh, there's no kiss from maid Marian obviously uh, but the prize is a golden arrow yeah which we also see in the yeah, movie that is in the movie yeah. yeah i would say in pile's version the reason that he goes and competes in this is a little closer to what you were talking about with men in tights mm, okay um he you know his pride yeah his pride he's, he's, he's a good like, archer yeah, he's like I'm he's better. the best yeah I gotta show everybody I'm the best. Um, but I think if you're going to put more focus on Robin and Marion's relationship, the addition of the kiss makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. uh, is it a, maybe a, a little weird to have the prize be a kiss? Maybe. Um, but I, I would. It, it would have made more sense to me if they had made. And not, maybe not more sense I, for the for a kids movie. I think a kiss makes sense. I, yeah. I, the thing I think that I would make sense to me is like, oh, the winner gets the hand in marriage. I, that maybe is. A little over the top, but it was not uncommon top, for like, maybe. you know, tournaments to be held to and the winner to, you know, get the at least that's the thing you see at in, least movies. in stories. Yes, yeah, in stories. It's very, um, usually it's like jousting tournaments or whatever, like bigger right. tournaments and not just like archery, but it's not that uncommon. In I was I was going to say it feels possibly anachronistically historically accurate. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Um, but it, it works in line with Robin's character. I feel like the Disney version of him would probably not care so much about winning a golden arrow. Yeah, he's not as like arrogant. -ish. Yeah. I mean, he's got a little bit of it, but he's not as. Yeah. But he is going to care about seeing his long lost love. Yes. Yeah, that makes sense for sure. 
So uh, does Robin then attend said, uh, I mean, you've already established that disguises are a big thing, but in both Men in Tights and this one, from my memory, uh, Robin Hood attends the contest by going in disguise because otherwise he'll just be captured. Mm. Uh, and I wanted to know if that came from the book of going to the contest in disguise. He does go to the contest in disguise. And I have to say that I love the stork costume in the movie. I think it's a lot of fun. In the book, <clears throat> part of his disguise is an eye patch, which, uh, just to add to the impressiveness of his his shooting prowess. Ah. Uh, in Men in Tights, he has an eye patch, but he also has, and this made me wonder if this was what the stork was a reference to, was like an older story. In Men in Tights, he also wears like a big, long, fake nose to make him mm. look like an old man, kind of. Like he wears, no, mm -hmm. it's not like overly long, but it's like a bigger, like prosthetic nose of some sort to like make him look different. Uh, and I was wondering if maybe that there's something about him wearing a fake nose in older stories, maybe not this one, obviously, but in some of the stories, in order, as part of it is disguise, he wears a nose. And so in the Disney one, they have him be a stork, so he has this big beak. Right. As kind of like an allusion to that. Yeah, maybe. I, I don't recall <clears throat> anything about a fake nose in this text. Yeah. Um, but it could, I mean, men in tights could also possibly, that could be a reference to the stork costume from disney's version it, it, it very well be. could yeah you're right yeah it could i mean again it's not it's not that big but he is wearing some sort of fake like he's wearing like prosthetics yeah i mean he's wearing like a lot of prosthetics in the movie it's like over the top like obviously right. they wouldn't be able to do that but it did make me wonder maybe there's some allusion to <clears throat> one of the other movies or whatever where maybe he wears like a fake kind of like cyrano de bergerac mm -hmm. nose as like a disguise or whatever so interesting okay uh, and then in this movie, the sheriff competes in the archery competition, which uh, is not a thing that happens in Men in Tights. And I was wondering if it happened in the book. Uh, he does not compete in the archery competition in the book. He just presides over it. I, I do think this makes sense uh, rather than adding like a, a new character for him to go up against or just having it be <clears throat> like some guy. I, it also works because we still have Prince John to like sit around and be villainous and sort of fill in the role of the sheriff from the book. Yeah. Yeah. In Men in Tights, they have a ringer. I don't know if that's a thing they do in the book. They have like a guy they hired to win. Oh, no. From my memory, I'm pretty sure they have like a guy who's like the best archer in the yeah. world to like win. Well, except but then he's Robin not. still beats him. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, so then uh, last question about the archery contest <clears throat> is, and this is very famous. I assume this has got to be from some book, if not this one. Uh, and that is splitting the arrow in twain. It is one of the other things everybody knows about Robin Hood. He wins his archery contest. Uh, the, the person before him in the final competition hits the dead center of the bullseye. And they're like, how can he win? And then he shoots his arrow and he splits it right down the middle. So he wins. Seems unfair to me. <laughs> like shouldn't the guy get a chance and if he splits his arrow they just gotta go until one of them doesn't split the other because like robin just wins by the fact that he goes second that's true in this that instance true. Like, had they both made identical shots and robin had gone first he would have whatever it doesn't matter uh and we'll get to how that's handled in uh in men in tights once we do that bonus episode it's very different uh but i wanted to know if splitting the arrow and twain came from the book that actually happens a couple times in the book. Wow. Yeah. Uh, it was once in the competition, uh, and it happens also in an earlier story where Robin shoots against some of the king's rangers. So it's just a thing he does yeah, all the time. Yeah, it's just a thing he does. There you go. It's just a little neat little trick he does. I will note that in the Disney movie, I did not understand the thing where he has like an arrow that's like jointed in the middle i what I is think, going on there? i think it's just supposed to make them look homemade but his other arrow isn't the second one he fires doesn't do that i don't know <laughs> i don't know I, I always took it as it was just supposed to look like oh extra homemade i i thought it was supposed to be because he shoots it really weird too he shoots it way up in the air or is that well, it, I... it goes way up in the air because the sheriff like bumps the oh, bottom that's of right. his, that's right. uh, of his yeah. bow. Yeah, I don't know. There was the one where it's got the like, jointed in the middle. I could not figure out what that was supposed to do or what the point. But maybe it is just supposed to look like. Like yeah, you can make normal home it anyways. Well, I know you can. <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying. I always took it as just like a cartoony 
like, oh, look, he makes all of his arrows kind huh. of a thing. Okay. I'll tell you, yeah. I mean, that that's how as, I always makes as it. much because it sense doesn't as seem else. to do anything. No, it doesn't. Yeah. It makes as much sense as anything else. So fair enough. It also wouldn't work. That's not how arrows work. Yeah. Whatever. It's a cartoon. I get it. But he's so good. Yeah. It doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, I wanted to know, well, and obviously you might not have any information in this, but uh, this is because this character and is not in the book. But in the movie, and again, from Men in Tights that I recall, Maid Marian's lady in waiting, she can handle herself in a scrap. Mm. And I wanted to know if that comes from the story or if you have any extra background information on that. Because in both of the ones I've seen, Maid Marian's lady in waiting can can dish it out. So, as we discussed previously, can't really speak to the lady in waiting. However, I can read this excerpt from... Robin Hood and Maid Marian, uh, which a ballad thought to date back to the 1600s. <laughs> We're going to try. <laughs> is this Middle English? Uh, well, no, this is no, no, no. It might have been at one point. It looks a little bit translated. It's way too much like modern yeah. English for that to be. <laughs> I've um, heard Middle English. Yeah. <laughs> she dressed herself like a page. And ranged the wood to find Robin Hood, the bravest of men in that age. With quiver and bow, sword buckler and all, thus armed was Marion most bold, still wandering about to find Robin out, whose person was better than gold. But Robin Hood he himself had disguised, and Marion was strangely attired, that they proved foes, and so fell to blows, whose valor bold Robin admired. They drew out their swords, and to cutting they went, at least an hour or more. That blood ran apace from bold Robin's face, and Marion was wounded sore. Okay, how has this not been in every right? Robin Hood movie? Right? I'm sure it's in a lot of them that I just haven't seen, because that's that's classic. That, that I mean, that's, that's every action-adventure romance. Yeah. I mean, come on. Uh, so here you're talking about Ma- Maid Marian herself yes. as opposed to her lady. Yeah, there, her. there's a reason she's considered like an early feminist figure. Yeah, no, this is the reason. No, that's awesome. That's yeah. The more movies should have made use of that. That's that's yeah, that's that's a classic. Classic yeah. <laughs> scene from any... and then the, the ballad goes on to like recount how they realized who each other were and then like make out yeah i can just see this i can see this movie like i can see that i've seen this in other movies yeah. i just it's interesting that i have not seen it in robin and and again for listeners who have seen some of the other robin hood movies i'm sure there's just no way this doesn't happen and oh, no, there's no way this doesn't some exist of the robin some other hood movies movie. <laughs> for sure there's just no way you would have to be the worst uh director producer whatever ever to not include that in your fun action adventure robin hood romance movie just No way. All right. Does Robin have a hideout behind a waterfall? Because when him, after they escape from the the archery contest where they're almost captured, he takes her back to their hideout and it's behind a waterfall. Mm. And I don't, I'm trying to remember, I don't think, I don't think that happens in uh, Men in Tights, but it might. I don't know. Anyways, does, in the book, is there like a secret waterfall hideout? There's not. Um, their their hideout is just like very deep in Sherwood Forest, uh, but I have always loved that detail. Yeah. Secret forest hideout that you enter from behind a waterfall. Yes, please. Yeah, absolutely. Love that. <laughs> it's Faramir's thing. Yeah, Faramir's hideout in Return of the King <laughs> or Two Towers. Return of the King. Yeah, Return of the King. I think. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we get towards the end here, Friar Tuck. Uh, is in his church, and th- at this point, the prince has heard this. The what is the name of the song? Like, oh, um, I can't remember. It doesn't really matter. The phony king of England. The phony king of England yeah. making fun of Prince John. Very upset, raises taxes on everybody. Nobody can pay it, so everybody gets arrested. And the sheriff goes to the church or whatever where Friar Tuck is, and takes his last coin from the the poor person box. And Friar Tuck. Uh, chases him out of the church and attempts to fight him with like a stick or whatever. And mm. I wanted to know if that came from the if Friar Tuck was ready to throw down with Sheriff of Nottingham. <laughs> so that specifically does not happen in Pyle's text, although that moment is pretty in line with Pyle's portrayal of Friar Tuck in general. He's got a bit of a temper, 
Uh, and he's also described as a large man who's quick to get into a fight, uh, as are most of yes. the merry men. Yeah. Uh, Friar Tuck, another interesting, like his the portrayal of Friar Tuck can change yeah. based on what kind of story it is. Sometimes he's kind of a like a chubby old like doddering man, yeah. bit of a drunk. Other times he's he's a friar ready to throw ready hands. To yeah, absolutely. And sometimes he's both. <laughs> Uh, and in this story is, uh, and maybe not in the same way, but is Friar Tuck captured and imprisoned? And is that a thing that leads to kind of like our culminating action sequence in the movie? Friar Tuck gets captured, gets thrown in jail, gets sentenced to death by the prince because he knows that will draw Robin out of hiding to come save him because he's friends with Robin. And that's what leads to the big climax. Is there anything, is that similar to what happens at all in the, in the book? No, there's, there's not a story that is directly that in this book. Uh, Pyle does recount a story where Robin and the rest of the gang save one of the other members, um, Will Stutely, who had been captured and was going to be hanged, but it's not a dramatic jailbreak. Uh, but that is as close as Pyle's text gets to this part of the movie. So just to clarify, and you kind of went explain this, I guess. Is this kind of like an episodic, like... Yes. Okay. Yeah. So it's like vignettes. It's like yeah. little stories of adventures. Or yes. And some of them, like, lead into each other. Yeah. Like, you might have one that ends up with, like, and next we'll hear about blah, 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 blah. But it's not a big overarching right. narrative. Right. It's not a big overarching narrative. It's a bunch of smaller tales. Okay. Cool. That, that's kind of what I was getting from what you had said, but I, I just wanted to state it outright in case anybody wasn't clear on that. That's what the book that uh, Katie read was kind of a collection of shorter stories about Robin as opposed to one bigger overarching narrative. So uh, obviously you mentioned there is a jailbreak in the book of a different character, Will Stutely, which I wonder is Will. Is that um, Will Scarlet? Nope, two different no, characters. Two different, okay, just making sure. <laughs> Very similarly named, but two I, different characters. I was just wondering, I didn't know if Will Scarlet, <laughs> if if his name was actually Will Scarlet or it was a nickname. Again, I only know him from Men in Tights. Mm-hmm. Uh, he has daggers in Men in Tights. I don't know if that's a thing. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. Um, but anyways, uh, so, okay. So, there. but you said there is at least one jailbreak in the book uh, or mentioned. Uh, is anything from the jailbreak in the movie, they, they show up, they sneak into the prison, they say Friar Tuck, they get out all the rest of the the villagers who have been imprisoned uh and then they go and and meanwhile robin sneaks up to the king's bedchamber and steals all of his money that he's sleeping with blah 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 <laughs> i assume the whole part where the the contraption where they wheel it out the window is not from the <laughs> book but is anything any element of the jailbreak and the big final climax at the end does any of that reflect anything from the book I can't think of anything from this scene that appears in or has a close analog to Pyle's text. Okay. Because then my last question was, or or about that was at the end of this, Robin, um, he escapes by, he he jumps into the moat, he gets shot at, everybody thinks he's dead, but then it turns out he's alive and he escapes by using a a reed, like a hollow reed to Mm -hmm. breathe, like a snorkel basically, uh, to get away. And I was wondering if that element like the specifically the reed breathing underwater thing was something that you was in the book. Cause I, I had a memory of that. I've seen it in other movies. I don't yeah. know what, but I've seen it somewhere and yeah. it's not in this book. And I couldn't find anything specifically linking it to Robin hood other than this movie. Yeah. But it feels right in my heart. <laughs> I, I maybe I'm thinking of something from a similar story or some other branch of folklore I couldn't find anything linking it to Robin Hood, but like it feels correct There's to me. There's some other movie, very popular movie or TV show or something from our childhood where a character does that, if not more than one. Yeah. And I cannot remember what it is. I, but I remember that happening several times in like movies or TV shows that I've seen. And in particular, I have a memory of one where at the end of it, somebody somebody like sees them and like puts their thumb over the end and then they like, they like pop up from under the water, like as a joke, yeah. like as a practical joke or whatever. Oh, that doesn't sound familiar to me. Anyways, there's something with the using the reed to breathe underwater that I, I, yeah, it's from something else specific that I 
I don't, uh, yeah, I don't know what it is. I don't think it's Predator. Some, something like that might happen in Predator, but I don't think so. Which we, did we do Predator on the show? On this show? Yeah. Is Predator based on a book? No. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> for some reason I thought it might be, but I don't think it is. We watched No, you the know what I was thinking of? Sorry, predator not Predator. Movie. I was thinking of, um, uh, uh, Ram, uh, First Blood. Oh, sorry, yeah. not Predator. First Blood. I don't know why I said Predator. First Blood. Um, because it because it's like surviving in the wood, mm-hmm. like like in hiding from people. I was thinking maybe it, but I don't think that's it. No, yeah, I, don't I don't think know. that's it. I don't think it's anything we've done. To be fair, I yeah. just think that I have some memory bouncing. Although, around to be in my head. fair, that could happen in a further Rambo oh, movie. Sure. Yeah, absolutely could. Yeah, because in in First Blood, he's like running around a town. He's not like yeah, in the forest. Well, he's in the woods. For a bit in the Is he? yeah, because he goes into the mine and stuff, and yeah, there's quite a bit, and he makes oh traps. Boy, in the I don't woods. remember anything about that movie. He's in the town at the end, like he's in the town in the beginning. He gets thrown in jail. Yeah, then he escapes. Then he goes into the woods, and a lot of it takes place in the woods, and he ends up in a mine. Oh, that's right, that's right. And then yeah. he ends up back in the town at the end, like in the police station or whatever. I, but, I just. All of this stuff leaves my brain immediately Trust after me. an episode's over because I couldn't. I, there's not room yeah. in there. There's not space. Trust me. I get it. I get it. Absolutely. But yeah, it's yeah, I, I, I did have. But anyways, I don't like I said, I don't think it was anything we've done. I just had this memory of the read thing. It, it, it might even be men in tights. I don't even know. <laughs> uh, for honestly, who knows? But yeah, I, I just remember it from something. So, OK, last question. At the end, is Robin pardoned? And does he marry Maid Marion? So Robin is pardoned by King Richard near the end of this book, but there's no mention of him getting married uh, to Marion or otherwise. All right. That was it for my questions. It's time to find out what Katie thought was better in the book. You like to read? Oh, yes. I love to read. What do you like to read? Everything. Um, So... I would bet that this was because of budgetary constraints on the film, but I wish that more of the Merry Men had made the cut instead of the movie just using Robin and Little John. I I believe that is why. I know they're the same, like they're the the most (laughs) well-known of the crew, but like Will Scarlet would have been fun. That yeah. would have been fun. Uh, technically, Friar Tuck and Alan Adale are also part of the Merry Men, but the movie doesn't really utilize yeah, them. I thought that, that was way. interesting. I was actually almost going to ask that because, from again, from my experience with Men in Tights, Friar Tuck and uh, uh, I, I don't remember if Alan Adale is maybe, uh, but there are hand there's. In in that men in tights, there's a whole bunch of merry men. Yeah, uh, and there there usually are. There's yes. usually like a crowd of them. Yes, and uh, so I was I was wondering, you know, how many, you know, if he has that whole gang in mm-hmm. the in the book. But yeah, so obviously he does. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I yeah I very much assume it was because they didn't want to animate ten characters all right. the time or whatever. <laughs> yeah, he has a merry man, as yeah. it were. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Something that was really interesting in these stories was that Robin Hood and his band don't, like, stick people up in the middle of the road. They basically kidnap the rich, bring them back to Sherwood, feast with them, and then take all their money and send them back out of the woods. Yeah, that's how you do it. (laughs) Uh, Something else I found funny was how many of these stories are about Robin getting into a fight with some guy and then being like, hey, you're pretty good at fighting. You want to join my gang and chill in Sherwood? (laughs) And the guy is always like (laughs) sick. For sure. I want to do that. (laughs) Yes. So, yeah, uh, just to bring it up again in Men in Tights, that is absolutely (laughs) what happens every time. Uh, because yeah, Men in Tights definitely g- covers more of the the like origin story yeah. kind of of like yeah. the, the formation of the Merry Men or whatever. Whereas this movie kind of jumps in, we're already mm-hmm. established or whatever. But yeah, uh, Robin also has a horn that he blows to summon his Merry Men to him when he needs them. It wouldn't necessarily make sense in this movie since there isn't a gang of Merry Men. But I thought it would have been cool to like put it in the background or something. Yeah, yeah, for sure. In the book, they also have a treasure chest that's carved into a giant boulder. 
Uh, not as cool as a waterfall entrance, but still pretty it's cool. pretty cool. Something I, I feel like I had a Lego set that had a treasure chest in a boulder at some point as yeah. a kid. <laughs> um, all right. So my, my last thing here is kind of an extended note. <laughs> I want to talk about the last chapter of this book because it was awful. Yeah, that was today. We were, uh, were reading. I was <laughs> listening to it today. Yeah, it, it, when I've already seen the movie, it doesn't really matter if I finish the book before we watch oh, the yeah, movie. Oh yeah, no, no, I wasn't. Um, yeah. yeah. So the last chapter of this book, it destroyed me in a way that I was not expecting, and in a way that I have not been destroyed so, by a piece you, of you media. You mentioned this but in a hot minute. You mentioned this today. I had not asked for details because I was excited to hear about it when we were recording. So I'm, I'm, I'm ready. The last chapter covers the end of Robin's life. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he's pardoned by King Richard, and he spends many years like gainfully employed as one of Richard's men. Fine. When Richard dies and John assumes the throne, Robin journeys back to Sherwood Forest just to, like, see his old home. And he gets really nostalgic, and he blows his horn. And first, like, little John comes crashing into the woods, and then more and more of his men that he hasn't seen in years and years start just showing up. And I was like, oh, my God, tell me why I'm crying right now. Like, why am I crying at this? Yeah. But then it gets worse because King John finds out that they all went back to Sherwood and takes that as an opportunity to arrest them under the pretense that they've gone back to being outlaws. So then there's this huge battle and Robin's men win, but Robin Hood is injured. So he goes to see his cousin who lives in an abbey. She's like a nun. He goes there to get medical care, but she betrays him and uses it as an opportunity to get in King John's good graces. And instead of healing him, she cuts a vein open and lets him oh, slowly Jesus. bleed to death. And like little John can hear him blowing the horn and yelling for help, but he can't get into the abbey. And by the time he does, it's too late. And Robin shoots an arrow out the window and says, bury me where it lands and then dies in little John's <laughs> arm. <laughs> my goodness yeah no that's an ending i was traumatized this morning <laughs> holy cow and now let me be clear i think this would be a terrible <laughs> thing to include in a disney movie amazing for children ending. are you kidding me amazing ending. but i am putting it here and better in the book because it made me feel genuine emotion <laughs> and i i gotta be honest not a lot of media <laughs> does that for me anymore wow that's wild. Yeah, that's a that's a that is an ending. Holy cow! Uh, that is not how Men in Tights ends, <laughs> by the way. Men in Tights, I believe, ends in a very similar way to this movie. It was sort of like, oh, they live happily ever after yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's intense. I can. I mean, I can imagine why. Yeah, I. I can see why it would be so affecting. It's definitely. Um, yeah, there's a lot of drama there, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> For sure. All right, it's time to find out what Katie thought was better in the movie. My life has taught me one lesson, Hugo, and not the one I thought it would. Happy endings only happen in the movies. Uh, I actually wouldn't call this better or worse per se, but I like the movie's animal characters. I like that it feels like an Aesop's Fables crossover. And, and I, some of them line up nicely with like folklore symbolism too, like the sheriff being a wolf, uh, Prince John and King Richard being lions, uh, Robin being a fox, depending on right. how we're viewing foxes. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I thought that was fine. I, I enjoyed the animal yeah. thing. Um, I wish that her character in the movie was a little more interesting, but as I said, the version that I read didn't include Maid Marian at all. And she is a favorite character of mine, so I would have liked to read about her. Yeah. Uh, nobody in the book shoots an arrow with a loot, but I, that was fun, and it it felt very on brand. Yes. Yeah. The scene, the climax of this, where the entire castle is on fire, 
and Robin Hood is like in the castle and it's on fire. It's kind of scary. There is that one particular shot or scene it's where kind he's like, kind of intense. Like, ah! Yeah, yeah. And, and I always forget this movie goes from like one to a hundred in a span of seconds during that scene because the rest of it is fairly placid. I really like the final climax action scene, though. It gave me a lot of anxiety <laughs> as a kid, but I, I like it. Yeah. Uh, my last note here, I really enjoy the music from this movie. Uh, and, and this actually is a better in the movie because there are a lot of songs in the book. Oh, really? Yes. Uh, not super fun to read. Sorry, Tolkien. Uh, and, and pretty hit or miss listening to an audiobook recorded by multiple people. Yeah. Uh, some, some of them were fine. Some of some of them not so much. Yeah, uh, I'll just go it here. I had it in my odds and ends, but this is good a place as any. I I understand the appeal of the music in this movie, like this and Jungle Book in particular, having read those two recently or watched those two recently. Mm -hmm. But it just it isn't what I'm looking for in a Disney movie musical. Yeah, this is definitely like this is pretty typical for that era of Disney. Yeah, it's it's just not. Whereas that, like, I, I folksy, feel like, like, yeah, you're looking for I, more I like more the Broadway, sleeping Broadway, sleeping, like Disney Renaissance yes. type. Yeah, that's what I like in my Disney movies. That's, and again, what, that's what you like in your Broadway musicals. True. Too. Yes, that is true. That is true. Yes. Yeah, that is absolutely true. Uh, yeah, I want big sweeping bangers. I don't want like folksy, mm -hmm. like. I don't know. It's just I, it's not that I dislike the music in this movie. It's not like it's unpleasant to listen to. It's just again, it's not what I'm. If I'm going to go watch a Disney movie with me, like a, mu a Disney musical. Yeah, I, I don't want this. <laughs> I want something different. That being said, I did really like the score in this movie, uh, like the non, you know, m yeah. music numbers score, uh, like the cinematic orchestral score. Uh, in particular, during the final climax, the big battle scene at the end, like the big yeah. jailbreak and everything. I thought that score in particular was very effective. Like, I thought that was and it adds to what you were saying in that last note about that scene affecting you so much i think mm -hmm. a big part of it is the score is really intense well and this was done by uh what's his name who did sleeping beauty bruns yeah bruns and did he do the score or the or all of it do you know because i i thought he did the because i think it's two different composers but i could be wrong that does like the cinematic score versus the like musical numbers i thought i thought bruns did the cinematic score Maybe that's because, true. Well, I and know. I was bringing that up specifically because I really noticed this time around the similarities, particularly in that final climax scene, to some of the the score in Sleeping Beauty. Mm. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, it reminded me a lot of other movies um, from that, like that older, like 50s, 60s era like fantasy movies and stuff. We just mm -hmm. watched a movie not that long ago that was a huge childhood favorite of mine called... Uh, the court jester that had a, at times had a score that reminded me of that. And like the old Errol Flynn movies, like all yeah. those kind of that era of like action adventure, fant not fantasy necessarily, but you know, medieval, I mean, it's whatever. a type of fantasy. Yeah. Um, those scores, it reminded me a lot of that. Uh, and I really enjoyed it. I thought it was really cool, but again, yeah, the musical numbers just, again, not that they're bad. It's just mm -hmm. not what I, what I want when I watch a Disney movie. That's fair. All right, time to find out what Katie thought the movie nailed. As I expected, practically perfect in every way. More than I thought. Oh, yeah. More than I was expecting. Mm -hmm. we, we talked about a yeah, couple things. Some, yeah. um, so right off the bat, at the beginning of the movie, we see uh, Robin and Little John crossing a log over a stream. Uh, and Robin falls off the log when they're both trying to cross it, uh, which is a pretty clear reference to the story yep. where they meet. Yeah, I, it's funny because it's I, that's one of the things I do know about the story specifically of, uh, again, partially from Men in Tights. Uh, when he meets Little John, <clears throat> they they battle over the bridge. Yeah. Whereas in this movie, they battle over who gets to cross it. For, they're like, yeah. no, you go. No, you go. <laughs> no, you go. And then Robin still ends up falling into the water. Yeah. And yeah, I, very clearly a reference to their backstory, mm -hmm. which I thought was fun too. A uh, little John is also described as being an absolutely massive man, beast yep. of a man. Um, so having him be a bear makes sense, uh -huh. I think. Yeah. 
the sheriff in this book is always described as wearing like ridiculous purple finery. Interesting. Which is very similar to how he's dressed in the movie. I think in a lot of other versions, he is like wearing black. Mm -hmm. Traditional sort of like... Uh, yeah, like villain. a villain color yeah, all black. Um, but the purple works because that's like a, a nobility aspiration yeah, kind yeah. of a thing yeah. there is a story where robin disguises himself as a beggar which mm, he does uh -huh. several times yep. in the movie <clears throat> uh, there's also a story where he casually makes bullseyes while chit-chatting mm, which mm -hmm. he also does in this movie uh, and we do see at one point little john fight with a stave or a cudgel uh, and he's the best with a stave. A quarter staff. He's a, a stave, qu yes, what quarter have you. staff. He's he's aces at it. Yep. He's the best. Yeah. It's also a thing I remember from Men in Tights. Yeah. So there you go. So I was I was glad the movie included that because I couldn't remember. I thought there might have been a brief scene where he fights with a quarter staff, and I was glad that there was. Yeah. A reference to that. Yeah. All right, we got a handful of things to get to in the odds and ends before the final verdict. There was a note in the prequel that I found when I was doing research about the movie that said that Ken Anderson, who uh, kind of developed the characters and some of the initial story stuff, uh, wanted to set this in the American South because he yeah. wanted to recapture the magic <laughs> of had, the Song of the had South. such a good time making the Song of the South. Yeah. Uh, and it did it. I will say it, it. I was like, you know, that makes a lot more sense uh, when once I've heard the sheriff I was like, maybe that was the one thing that carried <laughs> over because the sheriff of Nottingham. And this is like got a very like Southern. Yeah. That, and like that guy did uh, did some other vocal work for Disney in this era. I know specifically he voices a character in the Aristocats. Ah, yes. It's another one that I have not seen since I was yeah. a wee child. So I, I just want to mention how much I adore and appreciate that made Marion's ear cap is based on an actual medieval style of headdress. Mm -hmm. That's a, a double horned Henan is yeah. what it's called. Yeah. And it just worked out real nicely. It just worked out. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, there was a little detail in the, this is during the archery tournament scene that I thought was really fun that I did not remember, obviously from being a kid that I thought was very, obviously I didn't ask about it cause I was like this. Very much a Disney cartoon thing, <laughs> but the the snake, uh, Sir Hiss or whatever, the the king's uh, advisor, during the archery tournament, he's like going to do reconnaissance to go see if he can see Robin Hood anywhere or whatever, and he finds some balloons, that, and which they obviously wouldn't have helium back then, but whatever, and he finds some balloons, and he puts his head in one, and then he spins his tail. And flies around like a Zeppelin. <laughs> and I thought that was so fun. I thought that was delightful. Totally happens in the book. What are you talking about? <laughs> I thought it was just delightful. <laughs> in particular, I love that they just had a guy go, <laughs> like, make the, the <laughs> propeller noise with his mouth or whatever. So fun. I liked that a lot. I, I've always felt that <laughs> it's really unfair that I can never have a flower ring that a lightning bug lands on. Yeah, I mean... You I'm, can have a flower ring. I can have a flower ring, but I and you can I, hope a lightning bug lands on it. I guess. Yeah, but you can't guarantee. But it'll it. probably never happen. It probably will never happen. Uh, so we talked a little bit about this uh, in the prequel about the reused animation. Yeah. Um, basically, all of the dancing in the phony King of England yes. scene is, is cribbed from other movies. And that was the main scene I had read that had yeah. reused the most stuff. It's yeah. uh, Snow, Snow White, White Aristocats, a... Jungle Book. Jungle Book, yeah. Yeah, pretty much all of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> they were like, let's just reuse all of that. I, I thought it was very funny in the scene right, where fr right before Friar Tuck gets taken to prison after like trying to fight the Sheriff of Nottingham, the Sheriff of Nottingham shows up and steals like the last money from the poor box. But before that, and I don't know if this was intentionally criticism. Like it almost felt like this was the movie kind of like throwing a little shade at the church. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But Friar Tuck uh, in his church, there's his little, two mice who yeah. live like in the wall or whatever. And Friar Tuck says something about like, n you know, all the money for the poor is gone. Or I don't remember exactly what sets it up. But one of the mice runs into their hole and underneath pulls out from under their mattress or whatever, like their final farthing or mm -hmm. whatever, their final coin. 
and gives it to Friar Tuck. And he's like, oh, no. And they're like, no, take it. And he takes it. And they're like, for the poor. And he's like, okay. And he puts it in the box. And I'm like, but now you guys don't have any. You are the poor. What is happening? <laughs> what? I, like, I mean, I, I don't know if it's supposed to be criticism or not. It it's all ends up a little bit silly at the end. It does. It's just because everybody is just destitute. At the that way point. the way it was played in the movie almost felt like somebody was kind of like, you know, this is kind of silly, right? Like just having poor people give money to other poor people. This doesn't I don't know. It just via the church. It just felt a little pointed in a way that maybe not. But I, I thought it was it made me laugh. So. Let's leave it at that. I also wanted to mention, overall, I didn't think, again, similar to Jungle Book, this is not my favorite. And, you know, famously, this era of Disney is not, like, the most (laughs) well-regarded era of Disney animation. Um, And overall, I thought this movie was not that amazing to look at compared Mm. to a lot of other Disney movies uh, from before and after this. But... There were some scenes that I really liked. And in particular, there was one shot that really stuck out to me where towards the very end where King Richard or King or sorry, Prince John is sitting in his chair in front of the fire with the snake there. And he's surrounded by all this money and stuff. And it's like this one particular frame, the way it's lit and everything I thought was really pretty and like a really nice tableau. And there was a handful of those moments like that throughout. Where I was like, oh, that looks really cool. And then a, a lot of it just kind of looked flat and kind of boring. Yeah. Like it just, eh, it, it's not, not that interesting. It's not the most interesting era of Disney animation for no. sure. No. Uh, all right. So <laughs> we're not getting out of this episode <laughs> without talking about furries, baby. <laughs> without talking about uh, the phenomenon that we all discovered when the internet became a thing of uh, how many people were attracted to Robin Hood. In this mm-hmm. movie, uh, as children, and the the joke here is that this movie launched a bunch of people into the furry fandom, as you mentioned. Yes. I'm not sure how how furries actually feel about that, but perhaps someone can tell us. I'm sure it didn't hurt. I, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we also have, uh, you know, for maybe the younger generation, we have Space Jam to thank for some of that, but <laughs> you know. There's there are and there's been there's every 20 years another movie comes out that uh, yeah, I guess spawns a whole fair. new generation of furries. And we had Zootopia <laughs> 20 years after Space Jam. They're like it's a whole thing, but um, I mean I think I think this is a little broader though. Like I don't I don't consider myself a furry. Like that's just that's that's not my thing. Um but I did experience very early feelings of attraction to Robin Hood. Yeah. I I think you can be you can find the, the some of those, you know, anthropomorphized animals attractive, especially as a child without being a furry or like be that well, becoming yeah, a thing no. that you're like super into. Because as a kid, I was very into uh, from space. What's her name? Lola, oh, Bunny, Lola or Bunny. Yeah. Like, but I, yeah, I'm not remotely yeah. like a thing that I, you know, is a thing I is, is, is not remotely on my spectrum of sexual interest today, <laughs> shall we say. So it's just, you know, it's not, it's just, it is what it is. But yeah, I yeah. think, but it seems likely that, yeah, I'm sure for a lot of people, we know we have at least one listener. I tried to, I tried to give it some like, some like good hard thought, this rewatch. Like, what is it? What is it that makes this character attractive? I think a lot of it for me is his voice. Interesting. Okay. Got a great voice. He's also yeah. just very charming. Yeah, he's very charming for sure. Yeah. I think it's his personality a lot in this yeah. movie. He's just, yeah, he's just very charming. Cause yeah, for Lola Bunny, they just like, she's just, this is the way she's animated. Yeah. But I mean, also, <laughs> I'm sure among other, I haven't seen Space Jam since I was 13, so I don't, or 12 or whatever when that movie came out. But, but yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I think for a big part of it, and, and that would make sense why maybe it didn't, it wasn't something where you were attracted to him, but it it didn't translate into something that became like a, a lasting. <laughs> it d- didn't make a lasting impression yeah. on him. And I think me. that's because you were more so attracted to his personality, you know, like yeah. his whole vibe as opposed to the fact that he was a fox. <laughs> or True. Whatever, you know what I mean? Or yeah. like a, an anthropomorphic but the, fox. The vibes were immaculate. Yeah, absolutely. Before we get to our final verdicts, we want to remind you, you can do us a giant favor by heading over to patreon.com slash 
This film is lit. Support us there. Get access to bonus content, including at the $5 and up level bonus episodes in this month. Like we mentioned, Men in Tights, which I'm very excited to watch as our bonus episode. It should be uh, very fun uh, and interesting because, uh, yeah, I was surprised at how many similarities there were uh, to this movie or not similarities or, you know, shared elements there were mm-hmm. to this movie uh, that I was not really expecting. But we'll we'll get to that in the bonus episode. And at the $15 and up level, you get access to priority recommendation, where if you have something that you would really like us to talk about, recommend it. We'll add it to our list as soon as possible. Uh, you can also do us a favor by heading over to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or Goodreads. Uh, follow us, like us, subscribe to us, whatever the heck you do on those platforms to, to see our posts, interact with them. Let us know what you thought about Disney's Robin Hood. Were you attracted to Robin Hood, <laughs> the fox? Well, what are, what are your know. thoughts on that? <laughs> Let's break it down. We would like to know. Uh, this is a no judgment zone. So uh, let us, yeah, give us your feedback. We'll talk about that on our next prequel episode. And then finally, if you give us a review, just head over to iTunes or, or not iTunes. What is it called now? Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, anywhere you listen to our show. Give us a five-star rating and a review. We'd really appreciate that. It's very helpful. It's very good. We like it a lot. Katie, it's time for the final verdict. Now, uh, are you ready for your sentence? Sentence? But there must be a verdict first. Sentence first. Verdict afterward. When Disney's Robin Hood won in our bracket, I thought this was going to be a very easy final verdict. The movie is a childhood favorite of mine, and I'm very nostalgic about it. But as it stands, I am finding myself a lot more torn than I thought I would be. The movie mostly holds up for me, although I do notice more issues watching it as an adult. It's a little light on plot, the recycled animation is pretty noticeable to me, and even though Sir Hiss is a villain, the scenes where Prince John openly abuses him are kind of uncomfortable to watch. I also think I could have done without the thumb-sucking gag. However, I still think the movie is a lot of fun. It may not be a thematically and narratively sweeping epic like some of the Disney Renaissance films, but it's light and fun and easily digestible, like a yummy summer dessert. I also think that reimagining the characters as animals adds an interesting layer of folklore flavor that may not have been present had they gone a more traditional route. All that being said, I had way more fun reading Howard Pyle's take on Robin Hood and researching the legends than I expected to. I've struggled a lot with burnout lately, and it was really nice and refreshing to engage with a type of media that falls into one of my special interests. Disney's version is arguably more accessible than Pyle or certainly anything that came before him, while remaining surprisingly closer to the source material than I might have guessed. But at the end of the day, it's a bit thin, perhaps not as meaty as other variations on the tales. And Robin Hood is a several centuries old legend that's managed to not only survive, but thrive into modernity. Let's face it, that's hard to compete with. I'm going to have to give this one to the book. Not to Howard Pyle specifically, but to the entire mythos that is Robin Hood. Fantastic. Love it. Very good. Katie, what's next? We've had a couple um, interesting genre switches this year so far. Yep. Uh, this is not one of them. No, we're like sticking we're right sticking in the same lane. Right, right in the same lane, <laughs> keeping it steady. Animated fantasy. <laughs> and we are going to be talking about something that I've wanted to do for a hot minute. Yes. We're talking about The Last Unicorn. Something I bet a lot of our audience has never heard of because I hadn't. Oh, I, I oh, I bet a lot of people who listen to us are going to be familiar with this. Can we run a poll? Sure. Just a single poll. I want to know. Sure. I want a single poll. It's just, it's just for my own interest. <laughs> a single poll. Have you? Okay, we can do like three options. Have uh-huh. you seen the last unicorn? Or first, have you heard of the last unicorn? Okay. Or sorry, let's do it this way. Okay. First option, I have heard of The Last Unicorn. Second option, I have seen The Last Unicorn. Third option, I have never heard of The Last... Well, I guess we just need those two. We'll figure it out. You get my point. I want a poll that figures out whether anybody has heard of it or watched it, because I had never heard of this 
before. Okay, we can do that. Um, <laughs> FYI, that will probably be just a Twitter poll. That's fine. Yeah, because it's fine. it's it's easy to set up polls on yeah, Twitter. That's and fine. It's not I just really want some else. segment of our audience. I don't care. We'll just direct everybody to Twitter. That's fine. I just want some. I just want to know because to me, I had never heard of this. Okay. And I've heard of a lot of things. I got a lot of things bouncing around. I, I know you've heard of a lot of <laughs> so things. So it's surprising when I've never heard um, of a thing. This m- could be one of those gender binary things. Yeah, it could be. Like gender biases, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it could be, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I, absolutely. I'm not not yeah, willing to admit that that could be the case. But I'm excited. I'm excited to check it out uh, and, and stay in this animation lane. Uh, and especially in, this, in the fun. This is Rankin Bass, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Looking forward to that. That should be fun. Come back in two weeks' time. We're talking about The Last Unicorn. But in one week's time, we'll have your feedback on Disney's Robin Hood, as well as The Merry Adventures of Robin Hood. We'll be previewing The Last Unicorn, maybe learning about something, too. We'll see. Until that time, guys, gals, and I'm Benny Pals, everybody else. Keep reading books. Watching movies. And keep, keep being, being awesome. awesome.